Hi guys, thank you for coming back to my channel. This is Tanya and you're... Sean! Welcome back to our channel. Please scream big thumbs up. What about the bell? Please scream the bell and you can like this video. Well guys, that's our mission so Mommy, you go ahead. Alright, thank you, blow kiss. Say see you later. See you later, Sean. Sean. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, hi, I'm Tanya, nice to meet you, hope you stick around. I am trying to upload more consistently now, and once I explain to you why I haven't uploaded since my last BoxyCharm video, I hope you guys will understand. Um, after that video, I started falling into a depression, um, and not just the normal depression where you can kind of just work through it and get over it it was very much so so deep I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel anymore I couldn't I couldn't function as a normal human being um, I had thoughts of suicide how I was gonna die how I wanted to die and not even my child brought me joy or purpose I was laying in bed until the last possible minute and went to work. I would put on a face of makeup just so I wouldn't cry when I was at work, which sounds stupid, but at the end of the day, it was the only thing that kept me going was just putting on that face, putting on that mask and getting to it and just working my way through it, working through my shift and getting it done and coming home and washing my face and going to bed but I wouldn't sleep I was lucky if I got deep sleep for maybe an hour or two before I was in that really shitty state of sleeping but hearing everything going on around you the cars leaving the cars driving cars doing this my mom up doing whatever um, until about 6 a.m. where I would fall asleep The breaking point was when Sean got sick, he was throwing up, and I cleaned up what I thought I needed to clean up, and my mom did the rest, and I just laid in my bed. At that point, I knew I was failing him, failing my mom, failing myself most importantly, failing myself. So the next day, I, I was off and I was just arguing and looking for a fight with my mom. And I told her again, I wanted to die. And I felt like as if I was a burden and I couldn't get out of my own way. I was just laying in bed doing nothing. I mean, nothing I was breathing I was existing I wasn't living so that night I called my boss I explained to my boss what was going on and I told her I was going to commit myself into a mental health facility of course she was worried of course you know she wanted me to take care of myself and to not worry about my job so I explained to Sean that mommy had to go see a doctor and that they were going to help her and that she would be back soon. I fully intended on staying five days. Um, <laughs> but when I got dropped off, I stood at the walkway. My dad hadn't dro driven off yet. And it was existing I mean it was very existential it was very late out of body it was existing and possibly and more likely than not not being on this planet anymore <sighs> or locking myself up because I couldn't handle life anymore <sighs> so I made that walk 
I made that walk into the facility and I broke down and I said I need help. The intake was intense. Um, they kept on asking me the same question in different ways to see if I would answer any different. Uh, they asked me about drug and alcohol abuse and I told them I haven't touched a drop of alcohol in years. I don't do drugs. I take my prescriptions as prescribed. Um, I had to list all my prescriptions and I talked to a doctor through the television. They use what they call telemed. And under normal circumstances, I would think that'd be, you know, really great. But there's not that personal connection you would make with a psychiatrist that kind of weirded me out that I was just a face on a screen like I am to you guys. Um, they admitted me. At that point, it was a loose diagnosis of a mood disorder. So, I went in. They, they went through all of my stuff. They wouldn't allow me my, <laughs> my, they called it a face scrubber, but it was my, um, my Luna. And they wouldn't allow it because it was electric. And I said, I didn't bring the cable. It's charged. Why won't you allow me my face washer like my luna this is like the core of my skincare i mean i brought no joke i brought and i'm not trying to laugh i if anybody knows me i laugh in very uncomfortable situations because i don't know how to cope it's very uncomfortable and it's either me crying or laughing but i realized that i could not bring my entire skincare routine so i just brought my face wash and my body oil and my face oil and they even went through it with a fine tooth comb to make sure there was no alcohol in it. Okay, totally get it. We're all a bunch of crazy people that could possibly hurt ourselves or want to hurt ourselves. The one thing I need to stress to you guys and anybody who's dealing with um, major clinical depression or what I am now diagnosed with, which is bipolar one, um, is that it's okay to have thoughts of suicide. Talk to somebody, get help. I will link anything I possibly can to get help, even if it's just to talk to somebody. But at the end of the day, it didn't. I mean, the meds helped, I'm on Seroquel. Um, but it's okay to have those thoughts as long as you don't have a plan. That's what they stressed to me the most was as long as you don't have a plan, it's okay to have those thoughts. It's okay to work them out versus thinking, okay, this is how I want to die. How am I going to do it? I no longer have those thoughts. They almost immediately stopped as soon as they got me on Seroquel. I was there for three days. Sorry if the light's funky, it's cloudy outside. I have my vanity light and my nasty lights in here. But, God, this is so uncomfortable. Oh my God, I thought it'd be easy because it was easier on Periscope. If you haven't caught that, I'll link that in there too. Um, so the first night I went in and I hadn't eaten all day and I asked for something to eat. They brought out a box of crackers and some fruit. So I said, okay, I'll just eat the crackers and I'll be fine until the morning. I have to say the only redeeming thing about this place, and maybe once I'm in a, I'm in a good state of mind, I wanna be in a better state of mind to really kind of bring awareness to how people in my position are treated in mental health facilities. Um, but I'm not ready to do that yet. So first night they showed me to my room. I had a roommate. This person was withdrawing from heroin. And if anybody knows anything about withdrawing off of any type of narcotic, it's oftentimes really gross, really loud. And for that person withdrawing, it's extremely painful. Um, so I had the utmost empathy for her and sympathy for her, but I just wanted to sleep. So I got the last female bed. It is co-ed. 
I met some really great people. I mean, the woman that I that was my roommate, she was a awesome lady. She had a lot of problems, as do all of us. Um, but she made herself get out of bed every day. She could have just laid there, detoxed, and left, and it was would have been whatever for her to live her life. But she was merely, her and I talked, and she was just merely existing too. And she had a lot of things happen, and I wish I would have gotten some sort of contact information from her, and maybe we could have done something if she was comfortable with it. But I went out, and I asked, is there another place that I can sleep? I haven't slept in days, and I need sleep. And they said, no, you have the last female bed. I said, is there earplugs? Is there anything so that way I can at least fall asleep? And this was, the intake actually took like three hours. So I didn't actually get into a bed until almost 11. And they showed me the schedule with me. I would have had to been up at 6.30 for vitals and meds. And then between 7 and 7.30, um, breakfast was served. So now it was closer to midnight, and then I, I was just counting down the hours. I just wanted three hours. That's all I wanted was three solid hours. They wouldn't let me sleep out in what I would call the day room. Would not allow it. Um, we were not. It was, they gave me, finally gave me a patch for nicotine. Um, not that Not that morning, but the same day at night. And I was just like, really? I was, I was legit in pain. So when they started dispensing meds at 6.30, I noticed that the pill for my gabapentin looked different. Now I've been three, six, eight, and different where it looks different because every pharmacy is different. And I said, this looks different. This looks like a 600. This does not look like an 800 milligram pill. And she goes, it is a 600. The doctor didn't feel comfortable because you're at the top of the scale for fibromyalgia for gabapentin. He didn't feel comfortable with prescribing you what your doctor prescribed you for 800 milligrams up to four times a day. Did not, he didn't feel comfortable with it. And I said, okay. He, she says, he told us to explain to you that it is clinically proven to, with the gabapentin, to get up and move around and walk around and exercise. Well, Sally, that's what we'll call her. We'll call her Sally. Sally, I'm sorry, I hate to tell you this, but with the Seroquel, or the pill that they actually gave me because they didn't have any Seroquel the first night, the pill that they gave me worked, but I only got, finally, at 2 a.m., I got two hours of sleep because of the shooting pain from my back down into my shoulders, into my elbow, into my fingers, it felt like I could shoot lightning bolts out of my hands. I never really had a problem with my left hand. It's always my right because I'm right hand dominant and I sleep on my right side. So I tried flipping over, doing my exercises to get the nerves from firing. Finally started to drift off back to sleep and it migrated all over to my left side and was going into my elbow where I was, it, it feels like a muscle spasm, but works. So, that's where I was like, mm, I don't know about this. So I called my mom and I asked her to call over to our primary care because we all have the same doctor, our primary care and see if they can send an order over to where I am to re-prescribe the 800 milligrams up to four times a day as needed. She did, they sent it over. The second psychiatrist that I met with said he was not comfortable with prescribing me 800 milligrams of gabapentin. Even though gabapentin, Lyrica, all these types of nerve medicines also work for anxiety, work for um, parts, the different parts of clinical, the physical parts of clinical depression, did not feel comfortable. Even though the doctor that is covering for my doctor, who's doing Doctors Without Borders right now in Ghana, prescribed 800 milligrams up to four times a day as needed. Didn't feel comfortable. This is day two. So the Seroquel is starting to work. The thoughts of suicide, the rapid thoughts, 
all my brain finally was clear and I was actually able to sit down and have a heart to heart conversation with my mom. We were allotted 10 minutes on the phone. Um, we could talk longer if there was nobody else waiting. We just had to be respectful of other people, which I'm completely fine with. Had a heart to heart with my mom. I told her what was going on and I told her I wanted to come home. She said, give it one more day. And if they refuse what you feel as if is best for yourself, and they're going against what your doctor's saying, then yes, I will agree to come and pick you up. I said, all right, cool. Works for me. So we were in these groups, and they were trying to reinvent the wheel. Everything that, in, and I, and there was literally five groups, at five, wait, one, two, three, six sessions a day. I had to go through the schedule in my head. And then we were allotted free time in the evening after dinner. It was reflection time. So I took two. They gave me a journal, which was bullshit. Um, they wouldn't allow me a pen. I can't stand writing in pencil because of the feeling. I can feel it in my hands, and it gives me, and it's not a good ASMR-like tingle. It, like, hurts. I can't stand writing in pencil. I said, please give me a pen. I will write in, pu I will write in front of you. I just need a pen. I physically cannot write with a pencil unless I absolutely have to and it's at work and it's a mechanical pencil. It's not one of those um, sharpened pencils like we had in school. They refused. I said, okay, fine. So I made do with what I had. Never once did I meet with a therapist, an actual therapist or a talk therapist to talk out how I was feeling. Not one time. Except for when I signed myself out. Nice enough girl. She stayed in the nurse's bubble the entire day. Stayed in the nurse's bubble. I had the best night nurses and, and night aides that anybody could ever want or expect. They were amazing. If you were having a hard time sleeping, you could come out and talk to them. That was the closest I got to talk therapy in that entire experience in 72 hours. Other than talking to my mom. I figured out there was a lot of resentment towards my ex, especially now that he's still sat in jail. Um, but at the end of the day, it was about me and how I needed to control myself and what my triggers are. And now I'm going to explain to you what my mania is. And it's not, you know, the typical mania that you might see on TV or in movies. They show you the mania of super productive and running around and having tons of energy and then crashing out. My mania is super fun. My mania is irritability, anger, um, aggression. I was verbally abusive to my mother. I never hurt Sean. I never, it was just easier for him just to sit with me. That was it. That's all we did was sit other than when he had to go to his therapies. I was still able to get up and exist and get him what he needed barely. So my manias, you have all seen them if you're on Periscope. And I never realized that they were manias. And my night nurses explained to me, look, it's perfectly okay. If you're gonna if you feel yourself slipping into a mania, because you can actually feel it, you need to talk to your uh, a psychiatrist or primary care who's ever going to take over giving you your meds. You need to talk about dosing, maybe throwing in something else to help. Um, but at the end of the day, you can feel it, you can control it. So for those that I was angry towards and lashed out at, I'm very sorry. It's not an excuse. It will never be an excuse to be an asshole. I've always said that mental health issues, uh, any other mental disabilities are not excuses for you to be an asshole. It's a reason. And sometimes it's inexcusable and people can't forgive. And that's the cross that we all have to bear but it's a reason and I'm sorry I'm sorry to my mom I'm sorry to my dad I'm sorry to my best friend Shannon I'm sorry to all of my friends okay for what I may have said done had you put up with 
not listening, not understanding because I was in my own head and I was in my own feelings and I didn't have control over myself. And I think that's the most disappointing part is the fact that I've always felt as if I was in control, in control of my life, in control of what I put out there as a human being. And I've tried so hard to be, not be everything that everyone wants me to be because then that's not being true to myself, but being the best person I could be, being the best example I could for my son, being the best mom, being the best daughter, being the best friend. And feeling like I was a burden to everybody because I had issues that I couldn't work through on my own. And that was part of the mania. And there's a point where you're coming down from your mania and you're starting to slide into your depression where the two halves meet and you're so confused. You're so tired. You're just spent. And all you want to do is lay in bed and sleep. You don't care about anything. You don't care if you die. You want to just go to sleep and hope to God you don't wake up. Did this facility help me ultimately? Yes, they did. They got me the meds that I needed and the diagnosis that I needed. But now there's a flip side to this coin that's not so great. I found out from my boss that because I was out of work, they have to give me a, a release. I have to have a release to come back to work, which totally understand. But because of people with mood disorders and anybody out there who knows this knows that you need to take your medicine right around the same time every night and need to be able to cycle through that medicine because that medicine metabolizes best at night, which means you need a set schedule for sleep. With my job, I have to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have this gut feeling that they will not accommodate my restrictions, which means a set schedule. So two possibilities are probably going to end up happening. One, I'm going to end up with no job. Or two, they're going to tell me to take, I, they can give me a set schedule, but I have to step down as manager and become a CSR and take a pay cut. Neither of which are really that great. And I'm super scared. I'm super scared that I will not be able to provide for my child. And knowing what I know about myself, and I've been researching and researching and researching, anybody who knows me knows I'm like, when it comes to mental health things, it fascinates me. And now that I've, I've known that I've been bipolar for years. I was afraid of the label. I'm still afraid of the label. I'm still very much upset that I have to rely on medicine for the rest of my life to be normal. Normal. To be able to function. To be able to enjoy my life. And now I have to worry about seeing the markers in Sean. Having to explain to him that sometimes mommy is going to get sick. If things don't start working and stop working the way that they need to. But now I'm also afraid that I can't provide for him. And without getting financial services from the federal government for disability, social security disability, you are not protected under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, because you're not federally disabled. You're not protected. So there are people like me who want to do the right thing, who want to work, who want to be able to be productive, are now chained with a label, which I'm fine with now. It took me a little bit, and this video is legit coming off of only a few days home. Now I have to worry about if I'm going to lose my job. Or is it going to be worth it for me to step down, take a pay cut, and know that I'm not going to be able to afford the things that I was afford being able to afford with this paycheck that I get every week? Or do I say, fuck it, 
and work with the way that I need to work it and hope to God that it doesn't make me sick. There are so many faces of mental health. There are people out here that you have you encounter on your day, daily interactions with people out in the public at the stores, at you know, at the bank, at the post office. Well, does anybody really go to the post office anymore? But you get my point. That have mental health issues. I know a lot of my subscribers are my friends because we all suffer with chronic pain. We're trying to not exist. We're trying to live with chronic pain. We're doing the best that we can. Then you add the mental health on top of it. Another layer. And there are some days, like today, for whatever reason, today I just want to cry. Because of how much and how many times I've failed my friends. Failed my family. But I know that I didn't because I went and got help. Anyone I've talked to before or after I went in are so proud of me because I went and sought the help myself. But now that I sought the help and I got the help and I'm getting help, I'm now I feel as if I'm going to be penalized for it because I'm sick. I mean, Dawn and I had a really great hangout the other night talking about mental health, talking about, I know this video is long. I know I kind of went all over the place, but trust me when I say I've filmed two videos today. Two. This is my second. I'm thinking about filming a third, but I can't get my boxy charm until tomorrow because it's in the office. I've never felt more clear in my life. Well, not in my life, but never felt more clear in the last year. I felt, I feel better than I have in the last year, in the last six months, in the last three months. Yes, have I been sleeping, ooh, excuse me, sleeping later? Yes, than I would like, but my parents understand that I have to find the right adjustment for myself, and they're giving me that leeway. I'm not waking up and saying, God, I'm alive. I'm saying thank you I'm alive because I'm telling y'all right now if I hadn't sought this help I wouldn't be here I wouldn't have been here much longer my parents knew it some of my closest friends knew it I knew it I'm proud of myself for seeking the help that I did. I am feeling better than I ever have. But now I have this other weight on me, like, okay, I go and get this thing for my job, try to get them to sign off on it. If they don't, try to go in my doctor and have her doc the doctor covering for her sign this thing, I can go back to work. I'm not as scared as I was when I walked into the mental health facility. I'm not as scared as I was when I was really talking to people about committing myself, but I am scared that I won't be able to have a job where I'm at right now. And I've worked really hard in the last few years to get where I am in my position in my pay. And I might have that taken because I'm sick and I'm not protected by the ADA. I wish I was. Do I want to take money out of my, you know, social security when I'm older? If it means that I can provide for Sean, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's, it, it's a long process for social security disability. And I really don't want to end up on social security disability because then I won't be able to work. I want to work. I want to do what I love. I want to be an esthetician. I want to do all these things. I don't want to be handcuffed to something that's part of me, not my entire being. 
this video is really hard for me to film right now because it's it's literally throwing myself out there saying I'm sick I got help it does not excuse my behavior but it gives a reason and again I'm very sorry I'm going to try to keep the edits as little as possible um, but you know at the end of the day we're all dealing with something and you don't know if what you say to a person online or about a person online will push them over the edge. You have no idea. I'm going to try to be a better person. I'm going to try to show people that not only am I different, well, not different. I'm more controlled and in the last month it's because I haven't said anything or done anything because I really physically didn't I couldn't do it I couldn't and I'm sorry I failed you guys I said I was going to post more and be more more active on here and I just couldn't and I'm sorry this is my outlet and Gabby Hanna Gabby show whatever used to have a merch shirt that said YouTube is my therapy. Makeup is my therapy. You guys are my therapy. You guys and my, my son and my family and my friends keep me going every day. It just wasn't enough a month ago. It just wasn't enough. And I'm sorry. But now I'm scared for a whole other reason. I love you guys, and I'm sorry for disappointing any of you, but I'm here, and I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to stick to an upload schedule, and hope to God that I still have a job come Wednesday. <sighs> Alright guys, I love y'all, and I'll see you in my next video.